put it on there wrong. I put on your thing that we were going to be looking at the first four seals of the scroll. We're actually going to be looking at the first six seals, which goes all the way through chapter six. Um, so not the first four, but the first six seals um, of of the of Revelation of the scroll. Um, so let's get into this together. All right, so this kind of gives you an idea of where we're at. Um, I, I just kind of I found this, and it was really helpful for me. This is good. The breakdown of the book is going to look like um, the first three chapters was the introduction and the letters to the or to the uh, the messages to the churches. Chapters four and five, which we did the past two weeks, was about the throne room, and you'll remember there was this um, this picture being painted in both of those chapters, four and five, of the throne room with specific images focusing in on the one on the throne and then the lamb um, who is worthy to open the scroll. That's where we kind of leave left off is, is there is one worthy to open the seals of the scroll um, and it's, it's a lamb. It's not, um, it, he, he hears lion and he sees lamb. And um, in these first five chapters, we're really introduced to the main characters of the book. Um, you'll remember that especially chapters four and five, we call that the central and the centering vision. It's central in that um, it, you know, it's right up, it's right up front. Um, we're given that image. Um, as we get into these uh, these images of um, destruction and judgment and, and wrath, um, we find our center um, in the worship space of of the worship of the one on the throne and the Lamb. And so those are the central and the centering vision. Centering is in um, everything that is in this story is about those characters, um, the characters of, of, of those that are being worshipped in the throne room. And so um, that's where, where, where we really left off was um, the lion of Judah being worthy. And that's what the, that's what the uh, elder tells John. But what John turns and actually sees is the lamb. And so that, there's, there's some important characters that we should review real quick that we've been introduced to. First is the one on the throne. Um, now this we assume and, and at different points are, it's identified for us that this is the Lord God. Um, we, we hear about this one on the throne even before we see the image of the throne. We hear in chapter um, 1 verse 4, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. Um, so that's the first description we get of this character. The one who is and was and is to come. In verse 8 of the same chapter, chapter 1, we hear that this one on the throne is the Alpha and the Omega, the Lord God who is and was and who is to come, the Almighty. So this is the description of this one, right? Um, Revelation 4, verse 2 through 3, um, this is when we're given the image of the throne. There in heaven stood a throne with one seated on the throne. And the description is really vague, but it's given to us as looks like Jasper and Carnelian. Um, around the throne there's a rainbow um, then chapter in that same chapter chapter four um, we hear of the elders the creatures and and for all that are in the throne room worshiping the one on the throne saying holy 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 these are descriptions of this character all right we know this character right i hope we know this who this character is scripture is full of images of of this god and and we when we think of who god the creator is that's who we should be thinking of is this um, one of the central characters in the book of Revelation. And then the, the second um, image that we're given in chapters 4 and chapter 5, um, and, and the, the, really the, the, the central character, the main character of the book of Revelation, is called the Revelation of Jesus Christ. That is the name of the book. That's what John tells us. And so what's being revealed is Jesus and who Jesus is, the Revelation of Jesus. So it's revealing to us who Jesus is. That's what this book is doing. That means that Jesus is the main character of the book, right? Um, and so uh, the, the, this character, God's Messiah, which we also learn in chapter 5, is also the slain lamb. Um, we hear in chapter 1 of this, this person, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, which we've talked about some in this class already. That's who Jesus is, the faithful witness, bearing witness to who God is, even to the point of death. Um, that's who Jesus um, was while he was on earth, and that's who he is. He is the firstborn of the dead. In other words, the, the first one to be raised to life, raised to new life, um, and ruler of the kings of the earth. All right, so there's authority there. There's um, faithful witness. This is who this character is, right? Chapter 1, verse 13 through 16. Um, there's, this is obviously a much longer description, but just as a reminder to a flashback to that chapter, 
Um, John saw one like the Son of Man, and we're given these images from Daniel and, and, and other places in the Old Testament of being a mighty one, um, but also like a person, like a human, human one. And so that's an important note of who this character is. And then chapter 5, verse 5 through 6, this is when the real revelation happens. The central and centering vision takes place. One of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, is worthy. But then whenever he turns, he sees not a lion, but a lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered. So um, this, this character of Jesus Christ in, in the, the revelation of Jesus um, is specifically imagined, um, not a literal lamb, right? Not literally, but imagined as a lamb, taking on the, the characteristics of a, um, of a sacrificial lamb. And then chapter 4, verse 8 through 11, again, or sorry, this is supposed to be chapter 5, I think. Chapter 5, verses 8 through 11, just like in chapter 4, the worship of the one on the throne, which is God, the Almighty One, is worship. Just like that, in chapter 5, we see that the same sorts of language of, that would be ascribed to God is ascribed to this lamb. No, we're drenched in that. Like, that's water for us, those of us who are in the church all the time. We, we proclaim Christ is, is the Lord. Christ is um, one with God. That Christ is, um, in, a, in a Trinitarian sense, um, God, fully God and fully humans. We're drenched in that. But that's a really important reminder um, that we think about. That the, the, one, the lamb, the one that's been slain, is being worshipped in, at the, in the same way as the Almighty One. Because they are one and the same. So that's the second character. Um, another character that kind of is, um, is, is in there but not described explicitly, um, and we really won't get like a really explicit description of this character. Um, and even, even us who are on the other side of the development of Trinitarian theology might even kind of find some like weirdness in the language that he uses to describe this character. But it's the spirit of prophecy. And we would say it's the spirit of um, the Holy Spirit is what we would say. Um, and, and those of us who, again, Trinitarian theology that says God is, God is um, three in one, Holy Spirit, Son, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, like one God um, in three, um, would, would see, we can see that in Revelation, though it's not as, as fully developed. That's not the point of the, the book, and so he doesn't fully develop it. Um, but we were introduced to this right from the beginning. It's described as the seven spirits who are before his throne. We see that in chapter one and then in chapter five, coming from the throne are flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And in front of the throne are seven flaming tor torches, which are the seven spirits of God. So these torches that are in front of the throne represent the spirit. But then specifically when he talks about the spirit, it's usually, um, it's usually his way of describing his visions. So in, in right there in chapter one, verse 10, we hear him say, I was in the spirit. On the Lord's day, he was in the Spirit. He had been captured by the Spirit. He was ex he was experiencing a vision that was from the Spirit of the Lord. And then, as we look at the messages to the seven churches, we hear this is the way every single one of them ends. Every single um, um, less letter, I think one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven times we hear this. But anyone who has an ear, listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. All right. Now, again, if you look back at that again. Those messages are from Jesus. The messages are from Jesus, and yet at the end of it, he says what the Spirit is saying. Now, again, as Trinitarian theologians, we say that that's because Jesus is, is God and the Spirit is God. And so it, the, the message, the point is, is that the message is from, the, the, from God. Um, and so, um, again, it's just that this is a character that is really, really important throughout the book of Revelation, though it's not given the, as much of a description as the Lamb or the one who is on the throne. Now we have one more character that we've sort of been introduced to in the first few chapters, first five chapters of the book, um, but we have not been fully introduced to this character yet. We're not even going to fully be introduced to this character yet today in our lesson, but I just want to, we just want to set the stage, okay? So much of what Revelation is is a drama. Some people have described it as something that could be acted out. Uh, in, 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 in Roman times, it could have really, it could have very well been something that was intended to be acted out on a stage. And so there's a stage set, um, and with stages also comes characters in that. And so we've sort of been introduced to this character, we'll be introduced more fully to this character later. And it is the devil slash Satan. And um, 
We find later on, I think in uh, chapter 17, that um, John clarifies he's, he's, called the set, he's called the Satan and he's also called the devil. And so um, it's not two separate characters, right? We wouldn't say that Satan and, and the devil are two separate characters in Revelation or anywhere else in Scripture for that matter. Um, but Revelation 2.10, we're, we're sort of introduced to, to who this character is. We're starting to learn about them a little bit. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Now, this is a message to one of the churches. Do not fear about what you are about to suffer. Beware, the devil is about to throw you through some of you in prison so that you may be tested. Um, so we're kind of, that's the first time we see that word, the devil um, or, or Satan of any kind. And then chapter 2, we see again, I know your affliction, another message to a church. I know your affliction, your poverty. Even though you are rich, I know the slander on the part of those who, who say they are Jews but are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. All right, so here's another word for the same character, right? And then chapter thir- or verse 13 of that same chapter, another letter, message to a church. I know where you are living, where Satan's throne is. All right, and then uh, chap- verse 24 of that chapter. But the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold to this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan. All right, so this is where we're seeing Satan and the devil kind of being introduced to us in the first few chapters. I think what's important about this um, because even though we're not fully going to get a scope of who this character is until later on, even even past today, um, it's going to be important for understanding what we're about to take a look at in the book of Revelation. What we've learned from this is that uh, what we can derive from these few mentions of the devil or Satan is that John sees those who oppose the Lamb as sometimes being the devil. I mean, look at this. This language, I, I think this is so powerful to, to see. Beware, the devil is about to throw you, some of you into prison. Now, John is not saying that literally a satanic devil character is going to show up in, um, in uh, one, of these, uh, one of these cities and literally throw the individuals in jail, right? It's not the devil that's literally doing, but doing it, but it, what, what John is saying is, is that those who are opposing the work of Jesus, um, persecuting, killing, throwing in prison, um, the, the, the lamb's um, witnesses are basically the devil. Not, not basically. They are the devil. Um, they're not just doing the work of the devil. They are the devil. They, they are the embodiment of the devil in the world. Those who are opposing Christ are the embodiment of the devil in the world, and they probably don't even realize it, right? Um, and then also in, in this one and in this one, especially these two, verse 9 and verse 24 of chapter 2, what we learn is that John is sort of equating those who are claiming to have to be teaching the gospel but have twisted it around in such a way that the empire is being comp- the, the faith is being compromised the empire is being accommodated um, that people who teach any sort of gospel that accommodates the empire that compromises um, the faith of Jesus they are um, in line they are in league with Satan because they are manipulating their confusing people about what what the gospel truly is and so again they are um, they are being. They are a part of the synagogue of Satan. They are. Um, they are teaching the deep things of Satan. And then in chapter or in verse thirteen, what we're being told there is. Um, and I, I think I talked to you. Well, I know I talked to you about this when we did that lesson. That I'm convinced that when he says the throne of Satan, he's talking about this place of worship where the um, imperial cult, where the worship of the the Caesar took place in in asia the central place of that it looks like a throne it's set up like a throne and so even those that are a part of the empire and worshiping um worshiping a man a caesar instead of uh, instead of god are is also in line with in league with satan that's really important and and you'll see why in just a little bit that those who are opposed to god those who are um, teaching the wrong things, manipulating people, um, confusing people about the gospel, and those who are encouraging worship of a Caesar, a, a king, um, those are all doing the work of Satan. And so we look at this again. Um, we've looked at the intro and letters, the throne room. We've been introduced to characters. Now we are moving into to the, a really bulk part of this scripture. Um, and it's ver- chapter 6 through 16, 10 chapters. Um, and it is a re- repetition of seven. There are three sets of seven that take place in these chapters. Um, if you started reading through it, you might would completely forget that you're, you're, that you're in the same section. It feels like you've moved on to, to a whole new thing. But what it is is there's seven sets, or there's three sets of seven. There are seven seals, which we're about to get into. Then there are seven trumpets. And then there are seven bowls. Now, 
when we look at this, um, and then this is just a, this is what takes place after um, chapter 17 through 18, which is probably my favorite part of the book, is focusing in on Babylon or Rome, and then there's the final battle and the new creation, um, and we'll get into those as we get come to them. Now, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. We're getting into the seven seals today. Um, what we're going to see as we begin to work through chapters 6 through 16 is that these three sets of seven, they're not chronological. All right, and what I, what I mean is they're not this, they're, there's not steps of completion in, in like a time-oriented thing, as in like the way that uh, creation is laid out for us, in day one, day two, day three. Now he says, and then, and then, throughout this, but he's not saying that there's a chronological order. He's saying, this is what I saw, and then I saw this, and then I saw this. And so it's not a chronological order of things that are going to take place, because actually what we're going to see in the argument that I'm going to try to make is that um, these, are, these are all the seven of the same things. It's being repeated. It's taking a different perspective. It's using new images to communicate the same thing. Um, there are, um, so, so there, they, because they kind of unfold from each other. The bowls contained with, are contained within the seventh trumpet which is the last thing that you get, and then the second to the last thing you get, and then the trumpet is contained within the seal, which is the second and the, the, the first thing, right? And so it, they unfold that way. Um, and then on top of that, each of them concludes with a final judgment. Um, and, and obviously there's not three final judgments, right? There's one final judgment. And so these three final judgments are all the same judgment, um, just like the, 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 the six before that come, the six things that take place are, are leading up to the final judgment. So again, not, not unfolding events so much as here's one perspective of what's taking place, here's another perspective of what's taking place, and here's a final perspective of what's taking place. That's really just kind of an introduction to where we're at um, and, and to kind of to help us as we get into these next 10 chapters to keep in mind that they are all connected um, and, and really like nesting dolls. There's this image of, of nesting dolls. They're kind of un, slowly unnesting. Hey. Sorry. That's all right. Welcome. All right. So um, Mitchell Reddish says, in attempting to understand John's vision, and this is kind of a reminder of some things I've already explained. In attempting to understand John's vision, the reader must avoid a rigid chronological it means like a, a unfolding step one, step two, step three, a, a rigid chronological interpretation of the imagery of Revelation. Apocalyptic literature is more impressionistic than descriptive. In other words, it's not about describing the future or the present. It's not about describing it. Rather, it's giving us images. It's giving us imagery to help us understand the spiritual reality of the present and the future and those things which um, would tempt us to compromise our faith. And so, so the images are to, are to be impressed on us so that we um, can sort of see the spiritual reality of what's going on. Again, that's revelation, the revealing, pulling back the curtain of what's really, what's really taking place. All right, so we're looking at the seven seals. Um, we'll be looking at the first six um, this week and then um, the seventh next week. Um, so let's read Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Hopefully I've set us up enough. It only took me half of the lesson to do that. All right. Um, beginning at verse 1. Then I saw the Lamb open one of the seven seals, and I heard of the four living creatures call out as with a voice, uh, with a voice of thunder, Come! I looked, and there was a white horse. Its rider had a bow. A crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature call out, Come! And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people would slaughter one another, and he was given a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature call out, Come! I looked, and there was a black horse. Its rider held a pair of scales in his hand, and I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a day's pay, and three quarts of barley for a day's pay, but do not damage the olive oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard a voice from the, of the fourth living creature call out, Come! I looked, and there was a pale green horse. Its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. They were given the authority over the fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, famine, and pestilence, and by, wild, and by the wild animals of the earth. All right, so just kind of as a reminder, who is it? it just, we just keep hearing um, 
He opened the scroll. He opened the next seal. Who is he? Just as a reminder, verse 1 tells us. Right, so it's the lamb opening the scroll, or the seals of the scroll specifically right now. Um, we're reminded that it was a particular worthiness that the lamb needed, um, that, that the lamb has because of his slaughtered um, state and, um, and his resurrection, right? That's what allows him to be worthy of this. Um, and then I, I just want to make a note as well. Um, these first four seals being opened, um, the, the voice calling out is the four living creatures that we were introduced to as well. Um, we talked about characters that we've been introduced to. Um, obviously, there's several that we that I didn't talk about that are that are more minor characters. Those four living creatures being some of those. So that's kind of what's happening. Is there there are this booming voice saying "Come," um, and so uh, just an important part of that. Um, so I wanted to give this image. This was helpful for me as I was reading. N.T. Wright. Sorry, you had a question. I got one question. Yeah. Color green. Where did that come from? That's the first time I've ever read. Pale green. Yeah, um, so it depends on your translation. The word that is there for pale green could actually be like a yellowish green color. It's it's kind of, I mean, the image that I get whenever I hear it, it the word is chloros, which um, is where we get our English word chlorine. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the connection there is exactly, but um, what, I've, what I imagine is what we think of when somebody is sick. When someone is like gonna puke or something like a, a, a sickly green, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, so this image is, was really helpful for me as I was thinking about it. N.T. Wright um, explains um, uh, this situation to help us understand the four horsemen. He explains that you know all doctors, counselors, psychologists, pastors know that when someone comes to them with a problem, the problem that they talk about may not be the only problem they have. All right. There's something deeper. The pain that gets someone into the doctor's office may well be a symptom of something much deeper, um, whether it be medical or psychological. The fear, depression, or guilt that makes someone knock on a pastor's door is quite likely to be a second or third, third order anxiety, which won't be solved until the first order ones are resolved, exposed and resolved, until we know what's going on at the deeper level. Um, this often lands the patient or person seeking counseling in a position very like the reader of Revelation 6. We finally pluck up the courage to go to the doctor. Now I'm going to feel well again. Now I'm going to be happy again. This visit will put me back on track. But wise doctors, psychologists, pastors know that they must first disappoint the patient. They must first disappoint the patient before any well, good um, healing can take place. Um, in order to get to the root of the problem and the effect and affect a lasting cure, there may be some disappointment that comes first. For counseling, the, the client may hear the question of, when have you felt like this before? What have you most been afraid of? What happened in your childhood that you think might be connected to this? And you begin to unravel and expose things that are more painful, that are deeper going on, that are causing this. Um, and so... Unless, he says, unless we lay out the problems to their full extent, no real healing can take place. Okay? Unless we lay out the problems to their full extent, no real healing can take place. Yes? I'm just reading this. But when he said the, you know, the word green, it's not in my Bible. It just said, and I look and behold a pale horse. Yeah. So it's a, it's a word that's complicated to figure out what color was specifically in mind. And so some translations will say pale, some will say pale green or pale yellowish. Um, yeah, so there's not, so the Greek is not very clear on what color in English we would call it. But it's a, it's a um, palish color, which could be green. Sickly looking hole. <clears throat> sickly, yeah, that's the, that's the image that it's giving us, is a, is a sickly um, color, the sort of the colors that we think of. And so this image is really helpful to think about. Um, we have to dig deep. We have to really expose the problems in order to understand healing, in order to know um, how healing can take place. And this is kind of how he applies this um, specifically to the four horsemen. Unless the ills of the world are brought out, shown up in their true colors, put on display, and allowed to do their worst, they cannot be overthrown. Unless the four horsemen ride out to do what they have to do, the scroll cannot be read. The victory of the lion lamb will not be complete. 
And so this idea that um, almost like there needs to be an allowing of the worst of the worst to happen, and that's kind of what takes, is taking place. Um, we'll get into that, that word allow um, in just a little bit. I think that's central to what we're looking at. Um, and then he goes on to explain, when the Lamb opens the first four seals of the scroll, instead of four glorious remedies for the world's ills, we find the four living creatures summoning four horses and riders each, so it seems, only making matters worse, right? So there's not healing that's taking place as this, as this uh, scroll begins to unroll, which you remember we talked about last week. The, the scroll clearly seems to be um, a, a symbol, a description of God's plan for rescuing the world. And so the very first thing that takes place is not a rescuing, um, but rather uh, more ills that seem to be making things worse. And so Wright is explaining that the seals being opened is a result. Um, it's an exposure Right? So going back to that image of exposing the deeper need, the deeper ill, it's exposing that, or we might would say it's revealing. Revelation, right? It's a revealing of the world's ills. That is what these four um, horsemen represent, or, or is an exposure to the ills of the world. I'm not going to read this, but I always like to tell you when an image in the book of Revelation is being pulled from the Old Testament. Zechariah, not just chapter 6, there's several other points in Zechariah where he talks about four chariots, um, and they're, they're described similarly, though it's slightly different as John likes to put a spin on things, and his, or John's image really puts a spin on some of the Old Testament images. But we see these Old Testament images crop up quite a bit. Let's look at these horsemen one by one. The first horseman, um, verses 1 through 2, Then I saw the Lamb open one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures call out as with one voice of thunder, Come! I looked, and there was a white horse. Its rider had a bow. A crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. Um, the image of a white horse can be a little bit difficult for, for us because what we're going to see in a few chapters from now is that Jesus is imagined as coming on a white horse as well. There's this image of Jesus coming on a white horse. And so some people have read this and seen the first horse as being Jesus, um, and then the rest of them are the world's evil. Um, I, don't, I, I wouldn't want to interpret it that way. The image is different. This is a different point. Um, this, this right here is being, be, this group of, of revelation is, is, needs to be kept together. And, and so we need to look at all of the images. Um, and I think what that, that tells us is that we should not imagine that the first horseman is Jesus. Um, I'm not going to interpret it that way. Again, I, I've told you that part of the difficulty with, with revelation is, is that um, we have to make interpretive moves based on the context of the text and the context of all of Scripture. And I would say um, that, that mistaking this for Jesus would, would cause a lot of confusion. The four horsemen are grouped together, so they should be understood together. Um, it's important to note that in the first century, this is just kind of a, a, a contextual note, um, horses weren't like a normal mode of transportation for just anyone. Horses were specifically war war transportation. They were for um, warriors. You know, you wouldn't find just anybody riding on a horse. It would, it would usually be a symbol of, of, warrior, um, of a warrior going off to war. Um, and so the rider on the white horse is a symbol of military conquest. He carries a bow, a weapon for defeating his enemies. He, the crown symbolizes victory over his enemies. And, and white is a symbol of victory as well. White is the color of victory. John says it twice so that we know. He comes to conquer. He comes out conquering and to conquer. He wants you to know what this horse represents is conquering, uh, the, those that come out conquering. Um, another image that I've always found helpful in, uh, to know about is that this description of the horseman having a bow, specifically fighting on horseback with a bow, um, those that are contemporary to John, John himself, um, probably would have, it would have been hard for him not to think about the Parthian Empire. The Parthian Empire, just east of Rome, caused a lot of problems for Roman, the Roman Empire. The way that they fought in battles, soldiers riding horses, they were trained as archers. Um, all of their soldiers rode on horses, whereas Rome, most of their people were not on horses. And so it made them very difficult, despite the fact that their armies were smaller, um, the Parthian Empire was never defeated by Rome. Rome could never uh, conquer the Parthians because of the way they fought. And remember, Rome's goal is to conquer everybody. And the Parthians end up causing some, some problems for them. So for John's audience, the idea, um, and this is just kind of another note, um, I've heard some people 
put, you know, think of the Parthians there, and they say, um, that means this would have been a hopeful image for John's original authors, because John's original audience, sorry, was um, being oppressed by the Romans. And so the Romans' worst enemy coming in and defeating Rome, that would have been a positive thing. That's not true at all. Um, it is very clear that um, it, this wouldn't have been a hopeful image for, for um, John's first audience. Just another empire coming in and oppressing and persecuting them just as the Romans did. That's not, that's not a sign of comfort. That's not an image of comfort for them. Empires will always resist the way of Jesus. And the same would be the case if the Parthians were the dominant empire. Um, anybody have any questions on the first horseman before we go to the second? All right. Second horseman, verses 3 and 4. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature call out, Come. And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people would slaughter one another, and he was given a great sword. Another very difficult image, right? Um, further representation of the evils of war. Um, perhaps the image here is of internal strife, specifically um, that the peace is being taken from the world, civil war, um, all of these types of things that are inevitable when, um, when empires begin to claim power, systems of power and borders being put up. There's always these um, civil wars, these, um, this internal strife that is happening. Red is clearly um, a symbol for blood. Um, bright red is the way it's described as, as um, the, the horse that he is riding. He's carrying a great horse. This is another image that John is not clear on, but we can look at the context of when it was written and to who it was written to and sort of get another idea. Um, while red certainly represents blood and the horseman does play a role in taking peace and replacing it with slaughter, um, some scholars have noted the description that is being given to this one being very similar to that of a Roman commander. Red was, the, was Rome's color. They, they, that was their color. Commanding officers often carried great swords. Um, if this is what John has in mind, it would be a great example of poetic irony as well. And this is one of the coolest images to me that to be pointed out. Rome claimed, I've told you this, Rome claimed to, that its whole mission, its whole purpose was to bring peace in the world. And they were going to do that by conquering everyone, by killing anybody who resisted them, by conquering the whole world, by, by being the only empire in the world. That was their goal, was to, to take over the whole world. And they called this um, the Pax Romana, that they were taking over the world in order to put in place Roman peace. But they were doing that through violent means of oppressing, um, killing anybody who resisted them, taking over um, different empires. And so this irony that um, that specifically what's described is that it's, a, its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth. There's this irony, this poetic irony of Rome claims to be bringing peace, but in reality they're taking peace. Everywhere they go, they're killing, they're slaughtering, they're bringing um, not peace, but, um, but the opposite, right? They're taking peace from the earth. Um, and so this claim to, to Roman peace is actually a fraud. Um, and I think that's a really, again, this is John doesn't tell us that that's who he's thinking of, but there are some similarities there that can help us understand what he's trying to communicate. Um, any questions on the second horseman? All right, let's take a look at the third horseman. Verses 5 through 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature call out, Come. I looked, and there was a black horse. Its rider held a pair, a pair of scales in his hand. I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a day's pay, and three quarts of barley for a day's pay. But do not damage the olive oil and the wine. All right, so the rider's carrying scales. That's a common tool that's used for selling goods, especially food, weighing out um, the amount. So that's clearly what, what's being symbolized there by carrying the, the scales. Um, these prices that are being announced would be, like, outrageous. Um, this is like extremely high. Again, we don't know this as modern readers unless we, we um, look at what the currency was like in the day. Um, but for those that first read this, for John's first audience, and for John, he would have known that this was crazy. Um, a, a quart of wheat for a day's pay and three quarts of barley for a day's pay. A quart of wheat um, for one day's pay. So that means that a man would have to work all day in order to earn enough to buy one quart of wheat, that's enough to feed him. That's it. 
He's worked all day long just to feed himself. If he's got a family, if he's got a house, if he's got other bills, other debts to pay, he doesn't have the money for it. Um, he only has the money to buy himself food for, for a day. Um, a quart of wheat was enough for one, one, um, one person to eat um, and survive. Three quarts of barley, it's the same. Uh, barley makes a, a, a cheaper, not as good bread, and so it um, takes a little bit more to actually make a loaf of bread. And so that's a really important note. Now, the mention of oil and wine is John's way of making um, this not just about natural disasters that cause famine, natural things that, that cause a famine to come, which is who this, this horse represents is famine. There's not enough food. That's why the cost is so high. But the mention of oil and, and wine, it's kind of a way to saying that it's not just a natural disaster. Right? It's not just a natural thing that's caused famine. Oh, there wasn't enough rain this year. Oh, there was locusts that came in and, and wiped out some crops. But rather, there's this injustice going on within the, the empire, within um, the nation. And, and so this mention of don't damage the olive oil and wine. Now, olive oil and wine were, were not necessarily um, only reserved for rich people. Like poor people could get um, olive oil. They could get wine in the Roman Empire. But if you're in the midst of the famine... You could barely afford to buy enough bread for one day. Then you're not buying olive oil. You're not buying wine. You don't have the money for it. And so in the midst of a famine, the only people that would have the resources to buy olive oil and to buy wine would be those who are wealthy, those who are well off, um, who are not affected by the famine in the same way. And so there's this sort of this level of injustice that's going on with this third horseman as well, of not only natural disaster that's caused famine, but also... Um, the way that the empire has distributed resources and prioritized taking care of those who are wealthy and those who are rich over um, making sure that people get fed. And so um, it's a vision of greed and selfishness among the haves who exhibit no concern for the have-nots. That's really what's taking place. Um, any questions on the third horseman? Or thoughts? Again, I warned you earlier that it was kind of more lecture style this, this evening. I apologize for that. Hopefully we'll make it through. Um, is that right? Oh, I didn't change the title. It's the fourth horseman. That's messing me up. The fourth horseman, verse 7 through 8. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature call out, Come. I looked, and there was a pale green horse. Its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed with him. They were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, famine, and pestilence, and by the wild animals of the earth. Um, so this this last this final horseman represents death in all forms. It's almost like a sum a summary of of the three that come before it. Um, again, the pale green is the word chloros, um, and, and it's where we get our word chlorine. Um, it, it's we don't know if it's green exactly. It could be a yellowish color. A yellowish green color. I, I just imagine someone who looks sick, almost like a cartoon character who, who's like they're trying to communicate to you that they're getting sick. They, they would make their face green or yellow. That's how they communicate that that, that character is sick, um, is this pale color. Um, so sword, famine, pestilence, not only summarizes what the other horsemen represent, um, it's again, once again, an image from, from Ezekiel. This is another image from Ezekiel, um, um, chapter 14. And so sword, famine, pestilence summarizes the horsemen. What's important to understand about the four horsemen is that all of this is connected to human action. All right? If we aren't careful in our reading, we may be given the impression that God, the Lamb, um, they're bringing about this, this, uh, this, you know, what takes place when the seals become broken. In reality, all of these evils, just as in Ezekiel 14, if you look at that chapter, they're, they're a result of human actions. What's being described in these four horsemen are not like God orchestrating or micromanaging these events, but it's human sin. It's human sin that's causing these things to happen. It's human greed that's causing these things to happen. The horsemen represent humans, not God. We're told in the case of the second horseman that he is allowed um, or permitted. It depends on your translation. It might say he's, he's, um, he's, uh, he's to take peace from the earth. This means that, yes, God is allowing human evil to take place. God is the great allower. Um, and part of what that means is God gives us freedom. God gives humanity freedom 
Um, he does not micromanage us. We are not being micromanaged by God. Revelation is often read as God micromanaging things. That's not what's taking place. What's being, ta- what's being described is a revelation of what happens when human sin goes unchecked. What happens when we don't take a deeper look at what's going on? That, that, that doctor image, right? If we just deal with small issues, but we don't um, work at the deeper issues, this is what they evolve to, is, is human empires. Caesars, men saying that they are gods, demanding to be worshipped as gods, um, prioritizing um, the, the luxuries of olive oil and wine in the midst of a famine, um, causing people to starve to death and, and families to... to to go broke and, and be crippled. Um, so again, this, these are evils of humanity. It's not God micromanaging things. All right. This, these are these. This is revealing, exposing um, the reality of sin in our world and how it slowly evolves. All of this to say, as I implied earlier, the images of sword, death, and famine—they're from human sin, and they really aren't anything new. That's something that's really important. These are nothing new for humanity. Uh, The Bible Project says it this way. John sees four horsemen. They symbolize war, conquest, famine, and death. In other words, a tragically average day in human history. A tragically average day in human history. I think we so often read about the signs of the times. Many have claimed for years that, oh, now it's bad. Now it's bad enough. Now it's really, really bad. But in reality... Wars and rumors of wars that Jesus mentions, that Revelation imagines, they, were, they, they have been with us for before, from before Jesus was with us. They've been bad for us, right? You know, I think what we often have this tendency is, is when my country begins to have rumors of war, when my country is threatened with war, now I'm imagining that this is what Jesus was talking about. In reality, what Jesus is saying is, is that the world will continue in brokenness and sin um, what Revelation is saying is that the, the evils of, of human sin that come to, to brokenness and, and war and rumors of war um, will continue until, until, the, until he comes again. The point is, is that Jesus will come again, right? That's the, ultimately the hope and, and, and the trust and the faith that Jesus will come again. Um, despite the, the wars and rumors of wars, we have a hope that Jesus will come again. Um, and we're not there yet in the book, but we are getting there. We are arriving there. Um, I think that's an important note. Let's see how much time do I have. I've got 10 minutes. Um, let's see if we can... Does anybody have any questions on the, the four horsemen before we move to the fifth and sixth seal? I am going to kind of rush through those. I apologize. All right. Yeah. Okay, very good. Um, the scene moves on from earth back to heaven. We um, are moving back from where we've been. In earth, where we remember we were in heaven in the, the throne room. Then we were on earth seeing the events unfold with the, the horsemen. Now we're back in heaven. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar of the souls. Remember, the altar is already, the altar is in heaven in the throne room, okay? The altar of the souls of those who had been slaughtered for the word of God and for the testimony they had given. They cried out with a loud voice, Sovereign Lord, Holy and true, how long will it be before you judge and avenge our blood on the, on the inhabitants of the earth? They were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number would be complete, both of their fellow servants and of their brothers and sisters who were soon to be killed as they themselves had been killed. Um, just kind of quickly, the, the cry for justice. How long, O Lord? This is echoed in Scripture. We, we hear Psalms cry this out. How long, O Lord? Um, and, and it's kind of worded similar. Sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long will it be? And so this is a plea, a cry from justice. It's, it, it, it's the part of the Hebrews, the Israelites, the people of God's history. Think back to, to Exodus when they're in, in Egypt. They're crying out to the Lord for justice. Then when they're in Babylon, they're crying out for justice. In Rome, we see that in the New Testament. They're crying out for justice. It's cried out. Through the Psalms, throughout the Old Testament, throughout Scripture, how long, O Lord? It's a cry for justice. It's even cried out in the very beginning when Abel is killed by Cain. We hear that that his blood is crying out to God from from the dirt, right? It's a cry for justice, and it is a theme throughout Scripture um, that comes as a result of sin. And so the cry is the cry for justice. If God would just reveal the truth, then their deaths would be proven as unjust. 
and sin would um, and a sin against the Creator Himself and the only tr the on the one who is truly on the throne. Um, I think that the toughest part of this section for me, when I look at it, is um, this idea of a fixed number of martyrs. Like there's like a number of martyrs that there has to be. You know, we don't we don't know if John means this as a literal number or not. We're not given the number. And so there's no reason for us to speculate on that number, right? That there's a specific number of martyrs, people who will be killed for the faith. Um, the point seems to be that there would be more killed for the faith. <laughs> That's ultimately his point, is that not everybody who's been killed for the faith has been killed yet. Um, that's really the image, and that, that is like it, it hurts. It's it's painful to hear that, especially. I mean, I imagine if they're for for them hearing that that not everyone who has been killed for the faith in Jesus will have been killed yet. And so that's what one of the things that obviously we're supposed to know from this text is that there are more that will be killed. Um, and so the worst of the persecution of the people are, is not behind them. It's not behind the original readers. More tribulation was coming. So the impression could be that the martyrs are suffering, um, but I don't think that's it either. The, there's an, like I, when I read it, it sounds like they're suffering, they're under the altar. That's really probably more of a way to say that they're being honored, they're buried under the altar. Um, that, that's not, they're being crushed under the altar so much as um, they're, they're, they're buried under the altar, art, the altar and they're awaiting their, their completed um, transformation and new, new body. What we're told is that they're given um, white robes and, and they, they are um, told to rest a little longer before their resurrection, the resurrection of their bodies. And so um, I don't think it, it, it kind of whenever you first read it, it might be you get the implication that they're suffering during this. And that's part of why they're crying out. But it seems that their crying is more um, um, even that word avenge being used to, to show, to demonstrate, to reveal that we were right, that we were um, in the right um, so, that, so that people will change and so that the world will change. Um, and so, like the whole book of Revelation, what is being communicated is two things. There are two things being communicated throughout Revelation. We're going to keep re repeating this every time we get it. One, more suffering is coming. As long as, as long as this world is in the power of sin and evil and death, more suffering is going to happen. And then two, we have a hope. We have a hope that there will be resurrection, that may, all things will be made new. Those are the two things. And so that what's being communicated there is that, that yes, there's, a, there's, there's more suffering to come, but hold on. Have hope for new, new creation is coming. We're still very many chapters away from it, but new creation is coming. Um, and so that's, that's really what's being communicated here in this one. And I've got just a, probably like a minute. Or I've got five minutes. Sweet, sweet. All right. Um, verses 12 through 17. Anybody have any questions about that still before I move on? No, I'm rushing. I'm rushing through this. I don't like it, but. All right. Verse 12 through 17. When you open the sixth seal, I looked, and there came a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood. And the stars in the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree drops its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll rolling itself up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the magnates and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone slave and free hid in the caves among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, Follow us and hide us from the face of the one seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come. And who is able to stand. Who is able to stand? Um, there's a common apocalyptic notion that even the foundations of the earth would shake as a result of human sin, but as well as God's work of redemption. God's justice that was coming, it was a sign that, that, the, that the earth would respond. Um, I'm taking the perspective, and I'm, te I'm teaching this class in such a way that I would say, these are images, right? Taking these literally... Um, isn't necessarily the intention here. The, the, the intention is to say that the, the foundations of the earth, that, that the evil in the world is shaking. Um, we're specifically given the image of the kings of the earth, the magnates, which is uh, like noblemen, the generals, the rich in power, everyone, slave and free. Everyone who is slave and free and everyone who is rich and powerful and this emphasis on those that, are, that hold the power in the world are hiding from the justice of, uh, from the wrath of the Lamb, from the justice of God, from ju God's justice coming, um, and so 
Uh, yes, John clarifies that everyone fears, but he especially highlights kings, magnates, generals, rich and powerful. It's these, after all, that are the most responsible for the persecution of the followers and the oppression of the poor, of the poor right? Who's persecuting Christians? Primarily the rich and powerful. It's primarily those who hold power that are persecuting the Christians. Um, I think this idea, this, this idea of the wrath of the Lamb, um, now, again, those of us who have grown up in the church, we can sort of imagine what this means. But if you think about it, like logically, it kind of seems silly, right? The wrath of a lamb. Imagine a literal lamb having wrath. <laughs> what would that be like? It's kind of funny. Um, the wrath of the lamb, it's an interesting concept. Consider how a lamb, we just talked about this last week, what a lamb is compared to a lion. A lamb is meek and mild, and we're specifically told the wrath of the lamb. It doesn't say the wrath of the lion. It says the wrath of the lamb, right? And so it's very important that, that the wrath that's being described is the wrath of a lamb, not a wrath of a lion. We're not given the image. We're not now taken back and said, well, actually, it is a lion. No, it's still the lamb who has this. And so this image is sort of a paradox. Um, we're going to take a look at what it looks like because we're going to get more descriptions of what, what the wrath of the lamb is later on in the book. But there's just a few notes that we can make right now. Um, the wrath of the lamb and of God is serious, right? And so I, I know I'm, I'm saying that it's kind of it sound, it feel, it seems silly if you think of that image of a, of a wrathful lamb. But in all reality, it's very serious, right? God's wrath, God's anger, God's justice is serious. God takes sin seriously, right? You believe that? God takes sin seriously. Um, why? Not because God made a bunch of rules and he's just mad at us because we broke them, or he's just mad at people that break them. No, because those rules, the, 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 what sin is actually is, is destructive, it is brokenness. It is bringing brokenness. Again, that's what the, the four horsemen are giving us. They're saying this is what sin results in. This is why, you, why, we, why we follow in God's law. This is why we follow in the way of the Lamb. Is because sin is brokenness. Sin brings brokenness. And so God is, there's wrath, there's anger, there's justice, there's judgment directed towards sin. Um, not because God is petty and is just mad that we broke some rules. That's not it. It's that that. Us breaking the law and the rules of God, the, the things that the, the way of the Lamb results in brokenness in the world. It results in, in, in more sin and more brokenness in the world, which God created good. God created creation good. And so um, God's wrath is directed towards that which destroys God's good creation. Um, and, and that's where the wrath is directed, and it's serious, and it's important that we note that. Um, and then God's wrath isn't vindictive. Um, even the call there is, uh, is um, in, in the, before this, is, is how long, you know, when are you going to vindicate us? Um, and, and, and I don't think we should think of the image of, like, I want them to get killed because they killed me. But rather what they want is to, for it to be revealed that they were right, that following the Lamb was right. And so God's wrath isn't vindictive. It comes from the throne of love and mercy. Remember the image of the one on the throne. There's a rainbow over it. That reminds us of God's mercy. So in the midst of, of thinking about God's justice and judgment, we're also reminded and told to think about God's mercy. Um, and that's what the, the rainbow around the throne represents is God's mercy. And so there's, this, there's these um, dynamics of mercy but also justice, right? Mercy but also justice being held. And so God's justice isn't vindictive. Again, God's not petty. God's not just mad at us because we broke his rules, um, but rather it comes out of love. God's justice is to set things right the way that God intended them. And so that's what God's justice, God's, it comes out of God's love of creation. That's where God's wrath, God's justice, judgment comes from. We need to keep that in mind. Um, then three, the wrath of God is defined by the wrath of the Lamb. Okay, and again, we're going to look at this a little bit more later, but this clearly is a reference to the cross of Christ. That's why Jesus is identified as a lamb, is because of his sacrifice on the cross, so he sacrificially um, gave his life. And so God's salvation and judgment and justice, they're all one and the same. They're all a part of it. Again, God's judges, God's wrath comes in order to, to bring salvation, right? That, and so that's what the image of, of God on the throne, or the, the lamb the, it's being specifically the Lamb's wrath that we're looking at. Again, we're going to look at all that as we move on, but it's important to note that since it's mentioned here. And one final thing from N.T. Wright. He says, things have to be exposed before they can be dealt with. Things have to come to light before the surgeon can perform the operation. 
The soul of the world is aware of immediate problems and pains. We can look at the, the things and say, yeah, there's a problem. We can all acknowledge that. Um, so the soul is, is, of the world is aware of immediate problems and pains. But unless we look deeper to the ancient patterns of conquest, violence, oppression, death, we shall not begin to understand what needs to be done to be healed, really healed, rather than patched over for a few more years. Again, um, I think what we're going to learn in Revelation and, and what we learn in all of Scripture is that the call is not simply for us to sit around and wait until God comes and does all of these things that's being described and bringing judgment, right? That's not what we would say. The call to, to Christian faith is to remain faithful to the way of the Lamb, which calls us to, to not only not sin ourselves, but to specifically resist sin in the world and to promote active justice, active love in the world. I um, can't remember who it was that said it exactly. I think it might have been Martin Luther King Jr., uh, his wife, says that justice is, um, is love in action, right? Um, and so this idea that, that we're not just called to sit around and wait for, for the Lamb to do all of this good stuff for us, to bring judgment and justice in the world, but rather the call is for us to participate in what the Lamb is doing and bringing justice and, um, and promoting righteousness in the world. All right, I'm out of time. I'm, I'm going to be on time a little bit. Sorry about that. Any questions or final thoughts? I'm, I'm willing to, to stand around and talk afterwards too. So well, let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for your scripture, for your word, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity for us to open it and to understand it better. Um, would you help us, oh God, to listen to your spirit and be guided by you as we continue to make our way through this difficult text. Help us, oh God, to not be clouded by our own um, imaginations, but be open to what you are, are showing us and revealing to us in this word. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.